today, details on the $1 trillion bipartisan infrastructure bill are out. We have details and analysis. The eviction ban expires. We bring you the stories of both tenants and landlords caught up in the issue. And Square says it'll purchase buy now, pay later, pioneer after pay. It'll create a global online payments giant. That and much more coming up in NTD Business. Good evening. Great to have you with us. I'm Paul Graney. The debt ceiling is back in effect after Uncle Sam, after two years ago, Uncle Sam suspended it. Now we won't be able to borrow any more money until the debt limit is raised or suspended again by Congress. The Treasury says it's now taking extraordinary measures to cut spending until it's resolved. But lawmakers from both sides of the aisle are still pushing ahead with their $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill spent over five years. Republican Senator Marsha Blackburn, though, is worried that the additional spending on potentially non-productive projects will just add fuel to the growing inflation flame. Here she is on Fox Business today. What does this do to the debt? What does it do to our children's future? What does it do to inflation? But one of the bill's architects, Republican Senator Rob Portman, says it will actually somehow counter the inflationary pressures. President Biden said the same thing several days ago. Economists we spoke with didn't agree with them, though. The bill could inject over a trillion new dollars into the system. Lawmakers say they're not raising taxes to fund it, so some of it will be new debt and some will be unspent pandemic money. But both are increasing the money supply. There's $110 billion for roads and bridges, $39 billion for public transit, and $66 billion for rail. The bipartisan infrastructure bill is designed to bring our infrastructure up to date for a new century. And that is a significant achievement. But that's not all that's in the bill. It's over 2,700 pages long. It includes dozens of studies, dozens of items around safety on highways, railways, etc., climate change spending, including a healthy streets program and other abstract-sounding things. But despite the length of the document and the time it would take you to digest it, Senator Schumer believes it will pass this week. Last week, in a vote to begin debate in the bill, 18 Senate Republicans joined with the Democrats 6732. The final bill just needs 60 votes to pass. I want to congratulate the members of the bipartisan group for their efforts. We haven't done a large bipartisan bill of this nature in a long time. I got an instant reaction on the bill from veteran taxpayer advocate David Williams. He is the president of the Taxpayers Protection Alliance. And Vance Ginn, former associate director at the Office of Management and Budget. He's now the chief economist at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. I asked Ginn if Senator Portman's comments that a trillion dollar spending bill could actually help with inflation. Well, you know, one of the things I look at with this huge uh, infrastructure package, about $1.2 trillion, and if you think about that as being somehow deflationary or disinflationary, uh, I think that's counter to the sort of economic thinking that we have of, well, really, it's, it's more in line with Keynesian sort of economic thinking. This is on the demand side. I think what Senator Portman is, 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 is suggesting is that this will increase the supply side, help to bring down some of the price pressures that we have across the economy. I'm not quite seeing it that way. I'm seeing it as this is going to continue to expand the deficit. It's going to increase the amount of funds available for the Fed to print more money. And those are all inflationary. And so I see this as more of an inflationary pressure than a deflationary pressure like Portman has, has suggested. And David, we see the, the bill, I think it's almost 3,000 pages long. I don't think there are many people in the country, maybe even the architects of the bill, who've had time to, to read through all of it. But what are your high-level thoughts of what you've seen so far? Well, thank you. And therein lies the problem, is that a lot of senators haven't read this bill yet. And this is a process that is moving very quickly. And remember, this is $1.2 trillion. I would think that we would want to slow down this process look at the bill, look at the provisions inside this and not rush to a vote. And you have Senator Schumer who says that he wants to have a vote by Wednesday or Thursday because he wants to move on to the next bill, which is going to cost potentially cost taxpayers $3.5 trillion. So it's in the middle of summer in D.C. and a lot of bad things are happening for taxpayers. And uh, it's very alarming, quite frankly. From the taxpayers' perspective, what do you approve of in this bill? Is there, is there anything? 
Well, that's, that's a great question. And listen, infrastructure is something that we need to fund in this country. And let's be clear is that without this bill, we would still be funding infrastructure. So it's not as if if you don't pass this bill, nothing gets funded. This is about $600 billion in new spending, and it assumes $600 billion in already automatic spending for infrastructure. And when I look at it, the thing that really jumps out at me is this $7.5 billion provision for electric vehicle charging stations. I mean, imagine the outrage if Congress would pass money to build gasoline stations, right? People would be out of their minds crazy, and rightly so. But for some reason, EV charging stations don't get a second thought, and this is in the infrastructure bill. And quite frankly, this is corporate welfare, is that this is going to benefit uh, corporations, you know, Elon Musk, for example, but also benefit wealthy individuals who can afford electric vehicles. So to me, and no pun intended, but that's a non-starter. Vance, we see it. This comes at a time of the debt ceiling is back in effect again. We see, we spoke very recently about it, whether they're going to raise it or suspend it or very off chance default, for example. But to raise it again, it seems to me like we're, we're taking future prosperity, bringing it into the present. And can we really do this indefinitely? And, and, and is it fair to do it? Short answer is no. Uh, we, should, we cannot do this indefinitely, and we should not be doing this. Uh, I think if they're going to raise the debt ceiling, which they likely will, we need to put in some sort of spending restraint, like the Budget Control Act of 2011 would be one example, or the Text Public Policy Foundation's Responsible American Budget that puts a spending limit on how much we can grow government over time. We've got to put something in place because these deficits and debt are bringing about an amount of fiscal insanity that we cannot continue. Uh, this is America. We need to make sure that we're stronger for the future, and these things are making us weaker. It's not just the $1.2 trillion, and um, David's correct that part of this is from the other expenditures. We've already passed $6 trillion since the pandemic started. About $1.5 trillion hasn't even been spent yet. Why don't we think about using those dollars more wisely than adding any more in spending? And that's going to continue to add up to the national deficits and debt over time. And I really hope that we can get control of this amount of spending. I mean, you know, there's some estimates that show the next round of spending could be $3.5 trillion. There are other estimates that show they could be as high as $5.5 trillion. So we're talking about a massive amount of money that's being put into the economy. And most of this will be put on the back of the Fed, where they will then print that money and create more inflation and an already higher inflationary pressures that we're seeing across the country, which, you know, will, benefit, will actually hurt the poorest among us the most, just like many of these dollars that are being spent by this so-called infrastructure bill, which is really more of a, a green energy boondoggle that only about 10 percent of it is actually going to roads and bridges. And David, on the, the debt ceiling part as well, because obviously you advocate for taxpayers, there may be many taxpayers who are still benefiting from uh, social spending or et cetera, et cetera. What do you recommend to do in the short term? Because in the short term, I'm sure if we were to not raise the ceiling, not suspend the ceiling again, that some Americans or many Americans may get hurt in the short term. Well, what's your proposal? Well, we need to cut spending. Washington has never been good at cutting spending, but they need to get better. And when you have the Senate looking at a $1.2 trillion bill without even talking about spending cuts and offsets, they're talking about tax increases to pay for it. You know, they're going the wrong way with this, right? And when you look at the debt ceiling and the accumulated debt, let's not forget the interest on the debt. We're talking 300 to $400 billion a year just to pay off the interest on the debt. I mean, this is incredible to think that a lot of this money is going for paying off the, just the interest on the debt. And we can't sustain that. And, and Vance is right that when you look at the debt ceiling, at some point, we're going to have to say no, no more of this. And, you know, look back to 2011, the Budget Control Act or whatever, and cut spending. You know, Washington shouldn't be looking at more spending bills. They should be looking at the bills that actually cut spending. And, you know, one thing I want to mention is that, okay, there's a program, $100 million for healthy streets. And it sounds innocuous, sounds fine, but let's remember what happened about four months ago is Congress brought back earmarks into the budget process. So now we have a $1.2 trillion bill that is going to be susceptible to 435 members of Congress trying to get their pork barrel project from this bill. And I think this program, this innocuous Healthy Streets program, is probably one of the programs that they're going to earmark and get a lot, of, get some of their pork. 
David Williams and Van Skin. And U.S. manufacturing growth slowed in July, according to a new report from the ISM that tracks business activity in the United States. The report says that while manufacturing activity grew in July, the pace of growth fell for the second straight month. And while raw material shortage persisted, the report does show some signs of easing in supply chain bottlenecks. And some possibly good news on the inflation front. An index of prices paid by manufacturers fell from a near record high in June. Still, while the price index fell to 85.7, any reading above 50 means prices are still growing, but more slowly. And the CDC's eviction ban, which was put in place at the beginning of the pandemic, expired over the weekend. Lawmakers didn't extend it. So now tenants who are behind on rent face eviction, while struggling landlords get some relief. Here's Anthony Zolin Richards with more. The eviction moratorium has ended and delinquent tenants are facing eviction. We can't work, we can't pay. Around 7.4 million tenants are behind on rent, with 3.6 million saying they are likely to face eviction, according to the latest Census Bureau survey. How are you going to pay your electricity, cell phone, food? It's hard. Roxanne Schaefer is one tenant who's very likely to get evicted. She is unable to fully pay her rent every month. My landlord's been trying to evict me since January of this year. The only reason he hasn't, I have not left here yet is because of the moratorium. Up there is like all my pictures, my mom. This is my firstborn that passed away. Oh, yeah. She says she has no idea where she'll go and what she'll do. She has no savings because she spends the little she has toward rent. I lose everything and I'll have nothing. I'll be homeless out on the street. On the other side, landlords have been suffering too. We have many, many members that have exhausted all of their savings. According to government figures, the U.S. has 10 to 11 million private landlords who own 48 percent of all U.S. rental units. Many have been struggling alongside their tenants, such as landlord Tina Brown. Being strapped financially, um, dealing with COVID, dealing with not knowing where you're going to live, and then also dealing with the possibility of losing your property, it's terrifying. Tina lost her house when her tenants stopped paying, and she's had to move into one of her rental properties, right beneath one of her non-paying tenants. Now, that might change. Not only do I expect to see mass evictions across the country and filings, I also expect to see all of those cases that are currently on hold immediately move forward. Landlords are filing eviction papers in local courts. I've had one apartment director who has told me that uh, he manages multiple units in different complexes. He's told me he's bringing in just him alone over 300. The CDC imposed the eviction ban last fall preventing landlords from kicking out delinquent tenants. Possible. Congress failed to extend the ban Friday. The House stands adjourned until 10 a.m. on Tuesday, August 3rd, 2021. Arlene Richards, NTD News. And in virus news, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo today urging bars, restaurants, and other private businesses to consider requiring all customers to be vaccinated before entering. Private businesses, bars, restaurants, go to a vaccine-only admission. I believe it's in your best business interest. I believe it's in your business interest to run a vaccine-only establishment. He then suggested those businesses New York new, use New York State's Excelsior app, which essentially serves as a vaccine passport system. He also says the employees of the Metropolitan Transportation Authority and New York workers for the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey would need to be vaccinated by Labor Day or be tested weekly. Target will now require workers to wear masks in some U.S. counties it deems at high risk of virus spread. Walmart made a similar decision recently. Walmart implemented the rule last Friday. Target will implement it this Tuesday. It will also strongly recommend that shoppers wear masks but won't make it mandatory. Home Depot is adopting a similar policy. will ask all customers to wear masks in its stores. Stores will offer masks to those who don't have them. 
The changes in policy follow updated guidelines from the CDC. Target, will continue offering perks for getting vaccinated, workers can get free lift rides and pay time off for their appointments. And Pfizer and Moderna are raising the price of their vaccine shots in the European Union. They didn't seem to give a reason why. In today's Phil Zoe has the story. Pfizer and Moderna are raising prices for their CCP virus vaccine shots in Europe. That's according to the Financial Times. In the latest agreement with the European Union, the Pfizer vaccine is going up $5 a pop from $18 to around $23. Moderna is also going up, increasing around 3 bucks from $22 to around $25. That's up 25% in prices for Pfizer and up 13% for Moderna. Last week, Pfizer raised its forecast for annual vaccine revenue by about a third to around $33.5 billion. The European Commission says the EU is on target, getting closer to vaccinating at least 70% of all adults by the end of summer. Earlier in May, the EU said it's expecting more than 1 billion doses of CCP virus vaccines from four drug makers by September. Phil Zhou, NTD News. And stocks gave back some of the recent gains today after a day of pretty choppy trading led the major indexes to a pretty mixed finish today. The Dow fell 97 points, about 0.3 percent. S&P 500 lost 8 points, 0.2 percent. The Nasdaq added 8 points, less than 0.1 percent. And payments company Square, which is controlled by Twitter's Jack Dorsey, said today it's agreed to buy fintech company Afterpay for $29 billion dollars. Square's biggest acquisition ever create a global transactions giant with tens of millions of active users. Afterpay allows shoppers to borrow money instantly without credit checks, and consumers can pay back the loan in several installments without interest. Afterpay makes money by charging the merchant a small fee. Afterpay CEO said the move marks an important recognition of the Australian technology sector. 2018 Kim Kardashian promoted Afterpay as a way to buy her beauty products, it helped the buy now, pay later company crack the American market. Both founders of the company will each get a cool $1.8 billion from the deal and stay on at the company. Australian media report they're ranked fifth richest among Australian executive directors. Afterpay's American shares shot up 36% today. Square stock is up over 10%. A video conferencing platform Zoom has agreed to pay an $85 million settlement in a lawsuit over data privacy and Zoom bombing. Zoom grew in popularity during the pandemic but was at one point plagued by hackers. Customers complained that their private meetings were being interrupted by people shouting profanity or even sharing pornography. The lawsuit also says Zoom shared personal data with Facebook, Google and LinkedIn. In response to the lawsuit, it says it's improving security and safeguards for consumer data. But under the settlement, some paid subscribers could receive 15% refunds on their subscription fees or $25, whichever is larger. Before the proposal is final, a federal judge in San Jose, California will have to approve the deal. And American Airlines is offering customers flying in some of its aircraft 30 minutes of free access to social media app TikTok. It'll include it as part of the movies and TV shows that make up its in-flight entertainment and won't charge customers the Wi-Fi access fee. Comes even as the Biden administration conducts a security review of TikTok and other apps with perceived links to the Chinese Communist Party. Last year, cybersecurity experts warned TikTok was being used by the Chinese regime to spy on Americans. The Trump administration determined it was a security threat and sought to ban it. And house prices are booming in almost every major economy. And as we look to be heading out of the pandemic, at least for now, concerns our prices could threaten financial stability at some point. In the Patrick Hayden has a story. House prices globally are booming at rates not seen in two decades. OECD data of 40 countries show that only three experienced house price falls in the first three months of the year. The Financial Times says that's the smallest proportion since records began in 2000. 
Claudio Borio of the Bank of International Settlements fears that the boom is unsustainable and will eventually push activity into reverse. He says that's most likely if accompanied by strong credit growth. Annual house price growth among rich nations reached 9.4% in the first quarter of 2021. That's the fastest pace in 30 years. And in the US, home prices rose at their fastest rate in nearly 30 years in April. One property expert says prices for lumber over the pandemic have pushed house prices up. And now all the other materials seem to follow lumber. Obviously, copper's up, steel's up, everything. Steel is just recently, uh, materials that are produced in steel mills have just recently increased as lumber is starting to come down. So we're not out of the, out of the storm yet. Construction inventories have shrunk as global supply chains have been disrupted. This has resulted in building materials like steel, timber and copper to rise in price. And this is not expected to ease in the short term. Low borrowing costs make buying more affordable than renting and also other types of investment. Some have also accumulated savings over the pandemic. Average house prices are growing faster than wages, but the same is also true for the renting sector. Patrick Hayden, NTD News. And Dutch brewing giant Heineken has posted good earnings. It doubled operating profits to over $1.9 billion. CEO says the company is pleased with the first half results. But there is reason to be cautious. He expects full-year profits to be below pre-pandemic levels. The virus is expected to still weigh on the company's Asian and African markets. And rising costs for barley, sugar and aluminum will be a challenge for the second half of the year, he says. The company says the material effect will be more noticeable in 2022 when hedge contracts run out. And thousands protested across Europe over the weekend against virus restrictions. They say they're worried that their freedom is in danger. And these Evelyn Lee has the details. Over the weekend, widespread demonstrations took place all across Europe against government virus policies. Thousands marched through Germany, France, Italy and Switzerland. A Berlin court put a ban on the gatherings, saying participants of these protests usually refuse to abide by the coronavirus measures. Despite that, thousands attended in Berlin, around 600 were arrested. These relate, among other things, to violations of the ban on assembly, but also to violations of the Infection Protection Measures Ordinance, as well as acts of resistance and physical assaults on emergency forces. Germany has eased many of its restrictions, but many activities like indoor dining or staying at hotels require either proof of vaccination or a negative test. Some of the protesters in Berlin say the demonstration is part of their basic right. I have not done anything unlawful, especially according to the basic law, Article 20, Paragraph 4. Demonstrating is allowed and we all have rights. If you can hold a Christopher Street Day in Berlin, where 35 to 65,000 people walk without a mask, why do you need a mask outside? Another demonstrator told German news outlet Welt that they want people to wake up and realize that they're losing their freedoms. According to AP, Berlin's police department deployed more than 2,000 officers to try and disperse the protest. It says they were harassed and attacked while trying to redirect or disband larger groups. And over in Paris, thousands marched through the streets for the third consecutive weekend. Demonstrators protested against a special health pass, saying it's an attack on their freedom. French President Emmanuel Macron announced that people soon need to show vaccine passports or negative tests. Starting August 9th, people won't be able to go to shopping malls, restaurants or take long-distance trains without them. Tests will be done with a fee. Evelyn Lee, NTD News. And fresh worries today over the global recovery. There are signs that Asian exporters have hit a rough patch. China's factory activity growth slowed sharply in July. The purchasers manager's index from Caixin Market sank to its lowest level in 15 months. And at 50.3, it's dangerously close to going below the 50-point mark, which would mean a contraction instead of growth. There were similar drops in other Asian exporters too, including Vietnam, Malaysia and Indonesia. Possible factors behind the slowdown? rising raw material prices and the effects of stimulus waning globally. Oil prices sank sharply as a result. 
The picture wasn't all bleak today, though. However, PMI numbers held up better in South Korea and Japan. And which movie earned the most at the box office over the weekend, and how much did it make? We have the latest ranking. That and more after this short break. I'm Mike Lindell, inventor of My Pillow. Thanks to your support, you've helped make My Pillow become one of the fastest-growing companies in America. I'm interrupting this commercial right now. Retailers have canceled My Pillow, and to thank you for your support, I'm going to pass the savings directly on to you. For example, you get my six-piece towel sets, regular $109.99, now only $44.98, or My Pillow dog beds for as low as $19.99 with your promo code. Secure, the true solution for your digital privacy and security. Secure is a private and secure messaging and email solution hosted in Switzerland using military-grade encryption and Swiss privacy laws, giving you true privacy. Secure is 100% private and does not collect or sell any of your personal data. Secure's Helix technology connects you securely to our Swiss servers without the need of a VPN, guaranteeing privacy and security for all your communications. Secure Messenger doesn't require your phone number or any personal data that hackers target. Chat by Invites allows you to chat privately and securely with anyone outside of your secure network without the need for others to download Secure. Secure Send offers you a private and secure way to email anyone outside of Secure. You won't find this level of privacy or security on any other email or instant messaging application. Visit secure.com. Regain and protect your privacy today. 90% of news outlets in the United States are controlled by six corporations. They're not out to tell you the truth of what's happening. They're out to tell you the picture of the world that they represent. The mission of the Epic Times is to chase the truth to ground all statements and facts, and prevent people from being misled. This is a battle, a battle between truth and deceit. Subscribe today and join the Americans who are seeking truth and tradition. We'd love to have you on board. Welcome back, or should I say bottoms up? There's a new luxury tequila on the market, and its bottle contains 24 karat gold. It comes in a one-of-a-kind decanter that has a 24K gold trim. It's one of the first limited editions that made the brand has made available in the United States. It typically requires one a trip to its boutique in Mexico. Only 6,000 of the Class Azul gold will be sold for the price tag of $300. It's almost looking like a normal summer at the movies. Three new films landed in the top five at the box office weekend, and we have the early estimates. My daughter is innocent. Matt Damon and Stillwater debuted in fifth place with $5.1 million. $6.4 million gave Black Widow fourth place and a domestic total of $167 million. Old fell from first to third on ticket sales of $6.76 million. The Green Knight, starring Dev Patel, opened in second place, earning $6.78 million. Lady, leave the monkeys. The monkeys are fine. A pleasure cruise for Jungle Cruise. The adventure starring Emily Blunt and Dwayne Johnson easily debuted on top, making off with $34.2 million. Jungle Cruise also debuted on Disney Plus premiere at the weekend. Disney said it made another $30 million plus worldwide. There you go for streaming. That's the latest business updates for today. You can still catch NTD Evening News with Stephanie Cox. That's at 6.30 p.m. Eastern. For NTD Business, that's all for today. Thank you for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.
have a new channel. Subscribe to us on YouTube at NTD News. Get the highlights of our news broadcast and the most important headlines that we curate especially for you. Don't let YouTube decide what information you get. That's your choice. YouTube is deleting our videos and cuts you off from a source of honest reporting. Make sure you don't lose access to NTD's news content and take a quick moment to subscribe to our newsletter so no matter what happens here, you'll keep your access to a trustworthy news source.